So in that moment, I knew it was Satan, but I was still so prideful that I didn't turn because this was my whole life now. And I had the pride that I'm really good at this and just pride that I didn't want to leave it. Um, but one night I was walking across my apartment and it was just like any other night. Um, but I collapsed my knees in like a spiritual attack and it felt like my soul was being sucked out into complete darkness. And I heard myself cry out, Jesus Christ, save me. Oh. It was amazing to hear myself say that out of everything. But in that moment when I did, I meant it. And the God of the Bible, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit saved me. And whatever was attacking me was just gone. And I felt this peace that I'd been looking for my entire life. And I also was shaking because I was aware that, wow, God is real, the God of the Bible, which means my sin is really sin. And so I was terrified. Um, but I knew that that Jesus was real. Jack, it's so great to be with you today. Thank you so much for joining with me and sharing your story and all that you've learned since you were saved. Oh, it's such a joy to be on. And I'm just so thankful to be saved and to be sitting here with you today, praising God for that. It's amazing because <laughs> you and I both came out of um, occult backgrounds, uh, new age backgrounds, and um, kind of the secular worldly where you can do whatever you want, just go party and have fun. And, uh, and there's no such thing as restrictions or right or wrong. It was all just follow your heart, follow your dreams. And, and so can you talk about your background and how you were saved and what you're up to now? Yes. Yeah. When I was um, little, my parents went to a church and I went to preschool at that church and I thought I knew who Jesus was. I, I believe that Jesus was Lord, but I didn't have a real biblical understanding of what that meant. And so I went through my life kind of clinging to this idea of Jesus without, without having an understanding of the gospel or what it means to be saved or what does it mean that I'm a sinner. And um, when I was five, my parents um, separated because my dad had um, a drug addiction and alcohol um, problem, and it wasn't safe for us to be around anymore. And that was really hard for me because my dad, in my mind, was my closest friend and my most close relationship. And so there was a lot of pain there. And also around that time, I um, was sexually abused by someone close to me, but not in my immediate family. And so I was trying to cling to this um, small amount that I knew about who Jesus was, but um, with everything happening in my life and ultimately not actually having a real understanding of who the true Jesus of the Bible is, I just really um, lost myself in it. I'm so sorry. And I know how painful that is to be abused. And then um, you lost your father in the way that he wasn't there daily with you. I know that he's back in your life now, which we'll talk yes. about later. Um, and so with all that pain and with, with all that trauma, what did you do to cope? Mm -hmm. Well, at that young age, um, it turned into me acting out um, sexually and just being really um, secretive. I was really isolated. No one knew who I really was. I was trying to hide the abuse. I told myself if I just never think about it again, then it didn't happen. Um, and the ways I was acting out, I was thinking that way too. And that just progressed until the person who abused me was caught abusing a toddler and oh, wow. um, was sent away. And when I got that call, I freaked out and told myself, no, <laughs> like I, I, I can't handle this. I can't be found out. I need to take control of my own life. And I'm going to do that by pretending this never happened. And if I can never think about this again, if I can believe my own life that I want to make for myself, then then it didn't happen. And so I really tried to take control of my life by suppressing memories and by wanting to have some sort of control over my reality by letting myself define what the truth is and what, what actually happened. Um, and that just kind of carried out into my life of really just wanting to have my own reality and not wanting to face what I'd been through and dealing with it in ways of um, just trying to take control and hold myself up. 
So control was a real important way for you to cope with the memory of being abused. And uh, when I was a therapist, when I was a psychotherapist, my specialty was eating disorders Mm -hmm. of young women, and almost all of them had been sexually abused. And there was this real desire to control their body, their life, their future. And a lot of them, when we would dig down into the trauma, they would actually admit to me that they blamed themselves at some level for the sexual abuse, which was once you say it, then you realize that's completely illogical. But when you don't say it, it kind of hides in you. And it's just the secret that you feel bad about yourself with. Can you relate to that? Absolutely. And I'm so glad that you said that because um, really beginning to, to work through this, one of the big hangups I had is that it was somehow my fault still, like I chose it. And just coming to realize that was another form of me trying to control it. Because if I'm not the victim somehow, then I still have some way of control. So I'm so glad Mm -hmm. that you said that. And in my life, it, it did turn into, um, an eating disorder also that stayed with me for a very long time, but just these ways that I would try to hold myself together by taking control. And I just so wish that starting from the beginning, I had a real biblical understanding of who God is, that I could have had that to stand on and to know that I don't need to try to take control of my life because God is a good God and he's truly in control. Oh, man, I, I feel the same way. I Like you, I was raised with, um, well, you. it sounds like you even had a correct understanding that Jesus is Lord. I didn't have that, but just that kind of, okay, Jesus is here, God's here, but not having that underpinning of the solid biblical understanding and the true gospel is, it makes children just kind of um, just victims to Mm -hmm. whatever happens in life and and um, we don't have that solid rock of jesus in our understanding so so you had an eating disorder you were acting out sexually you were just trying to control your life and your thoughts i mean a lot of people don't know this but new age is all about thought control Mm -hmm. and so that kind of background that you had probably made you ripe for new age deception Absolutely. Um, And when I was young, I had experiences where at the time I thought they were angels, but Mm -hmm. once I learned about UFOs, I was like, oh, well, that must be what it is. But when I would see them, when they would come down, I would feel such um, a familiar feeling and I would feel special and just so many um, powerful things that made me also feel like I could, if there is something more than this reality and these entities, like I'm special to them, it gave me another form of maybe control, but it also really started to mold my worldview that these, this is so real to me. I didn't even know who I was because I'd been lying to other people and to myself, but this, I was able to kind of mold my understanding of reality around, well, I know this is real and this is real. Um, to me. And so I know that this is something I can look at and feel like, okay, I might not know who I am. No one else knows who I am, but they know who I am. And, and because of that, I have this special relationship with them. And so that continued going on as I grew up until I started to have an an understanding that they were, um, dark is maybe the word I would have thought, but at that point I decided to follow, um, this entity and go back to being who I really was later. It felt like there was too much for me to deal with. And so I'll go, I'll, I'll be a good person later. I still have time, but for now I'm going to follow this path uh, and see where it leads me. Okay. So it sounds like you were looking for self-worth and love and validation. (sighs) Definitely. And these beings, and I can relate because I thought I was talking to God's angels too. So Mm. got the t-shirt for that. And then uh, UFOs were mixed into that where you were, it sounds like you were seeing lights coming down or something, right? And yeah, that's, um, as we both know, those are demons deceiving um, lost children. And it happens too often. And so you decided there was one demon in particular that you decided to consciously follow and get into this path? 
Yes. Um, at that time, I don't think I would have thought of it as one demon in particular, but that this in that one situation, it was just one, but it was the whole kind of following that path or that deviant mindset. So I continued in kind of the double life. No one really knew who I was or what I was doing. Um, I never wanted to drink or do drugs because I'd seen um, what that led to in my dad's life. I knew that he loved me very much, but he just seemed to have no control over um, his addictions. And he was either like in the hospital or in rehab or in a halfway home or back in the cycle. And so it was really hard to, to see that. And um, I knew I didn't want to, to end up there. And so I said, I was never going to drink or do drugs, but ultimately not having a real relationship with God and not having anywhere to, to take this yoke to, to take my burden to, and just having this anguish building up in me. I got to the point where um, my identity and my worth was really found in my friendships or in my relationships with people. And my best friend um, started drinking and doing drugs. And so did our friends. And it got to the point where I just figured it wasn't worth it to me to hold on to the, these this maybe moralistic thing that I wanted mm -hmm. if it meant losing the identity that I had in my friends. And so the first time I drank, I knew I'd made a huge mistake because for the first time I actually felt numb. I actually didn't remember. Um, and I was able to escape myself. And that had been what I'd been looking for throughout my life was just to get out of my body and escape myself. Um, and so that led to me ever since that day, never wanting to be sober again and doing everything in my power to get my hands on um, alcohol or anything really to just escape myself. And so, man, I just, I so wish that, um, that I had, or just for anyone going through the same thing, it's just so important to have a biblical understanding of who Jesus is because I, yes. I would have said I was a Christian. I was offended if anyone said I wasn't a Christian because I thought that being a Christian was just believing in a person named Jesus and, and that was it. And so not having a true biblical understanding of who the Jesus of the Bible is compared to the Jesus of whatever other religion or what the world says, um, there's a huge difference between the two of being truly born again and, and being Christian because your family is Christian. And so therefore you are Christian. A lot of people are professing Christians, but they, it's like um, that passage in Matthew that Jesus describes where people will go mm -hmm. to him after they die and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Didn't we heal in your name? And he says, away from you, I never knew you because we didn't know the real Jesus. And that's the path that you and I were both on. Can I ask you to repeat mm -hmm. the statement that you just said, because it cut out in the middle and it's so important. You said, I would have been offended if anyone said I was not a Christian. Would you mind saying that again? Right. Yes. Um, yeah. If anyone had said that I wasn't a Christian, that would have offended me because I believed in Jesus. I thought that I believed Jesus was Lord, but I didn't know the gospel. I didn't know who the Jesus of the Bible is. And so even though I might've thought I knew what the world said Jesus was, or other people said who Jesus was, I didn't have a biblical understanding of who the Jesus of the Bible is. And without that, I didn't, there was no true salvation. I wasn't truly born again because I didn't know the true Jesus. There's only one real Jesus because he's a real person. Amen. That's so important. Thank you for reiterating that. Yeah. Okay, so so you were on this really dark path with drugs, alcohol, um, doing whatever it took to make your friends happy with you, um, kind of making friends with the world um, right. and, instead of friends with God, and, which we're warned about in the Bible. So what else was going on when you were on this very dark path? Well, in high school, the book, The Secret came out and that was um, a huge thing for me because I already had this understanding of reality where these aliens were coming from a different, well, from the universe. And then this book comes out that is talking about how your thoughts create your reality and universe, the universe is um, 
is basically everything. And so taking my deep desire to have a control over my reality with that, um, the supernatural experiences that I had had since childhood with this book coming out that's in Barnes and Noble and very popular, but that is saying things like you can have whatever you want. Uh, It works for everyone, everywhere. Your thoughts create your reality and you can manifest the life of your dreams. And that was so alluring to me because I desperately wanted to create my own reality. I didn't want my life. I didn't want to deal with the things that had happened in my life. And instead I just wanted to create my own reality, which, um, you know, I think has to do with Disney too. And just how Disney lied to us about (laughs) making our dreams a reality, but this was, um, a lot more real. It gave action steps and it showed how this is secret knowledge that's been hidden from us. And that if we just uncover it, we can literally magnetize anything and everything to ourselves. And that really got me excited and became an obsession for me, a desire to manifest things into my life. Um, But learning about that now, and even just recently looking back at it, and it just reminds me so much of when Satan tempts Jesus and, and just, you know, we're tempted to have all these things of the world, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's just vanity. There's what, what good would that even do if you lose your soul in the process of gaining the world? It just, um, one, it didn't work. I never got the like, spoiler alert. I never got the peace or the mansion or whatever I thought was going to make me happy. But even if I had, it would have never saved me. Um, and that that's just so sad. But as I continued down this path and ended up going deep into the new age and the occult, this was really my indoctrination into it because this and some things I saw in Disney and um, just my past of experiences made me going deeper and deeper, not seem that bad because it had already been introduced to me in such a um, almost harmless way, it seemed. Mm -hmm. So your introduction into the occult was through the very popular at that time book, The Secret? Yes. So how did you find the book, The Secret? And did you read it or what happened? Um, That's a great question. I'm not sure how I found it. I believe I first saw it as a movie And then I got the book and just obsessively read it and wanted to implement everything that was in it in order to gain some kind of control over my life. Did you know other people who were reading The Secret or was this just something private? It was something private. Okay. And there was this part of you that said, okay, here's the answer I've been looking for, how I can be in complete control of my life. Right. And it also, um, having the worldview that it did made... I was able to have kind of a place to put all these experiences that I'm having, the supernatural ones. They made sense in this world where the secret is a reality because if everything you manifest and the universe is almost is, is almost everything, then it just kind of allowed me to make sense of what I'd been experiencing. Okay. So the secret has kind of rules, right? You have to stay positive all the time. How yes. was that for you? Man, it it is really hard trying to be your own God because I I just continually failed. Um, It was so frustrating if I'd ever think a negative thought or if anything bad happened, then it was my fault for thinking that negative thought. So it just turned into this war with my mind. I could never get it quite right. And it's it's bondage at the end of the day. Um, But I really, really wanted it to work. I understand. So did it involve visualizing affirmations? What other tools did they give you? Um, A lot. Yes. A lot of visualizing and a lot of affirmations, a lot of um, paying attention to your feelings because your feelings are a good indicator of what your thoughts are. And just, it's hard for me to separate it from what I ended up getting into later, but there was just a lot of promises to give me everything I wanted and that it works every time. So you can't, you can't, it does work it, but if it doesn't, it's your fault because you didn't think the right thoughts or you're feeling negative feelings. Um, 
And so it ultimately makes you God, but that's a bad thing because we make terrible gods. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was a very frustrating time. Yes, I agree. I remember in the new age, um, because I was very afraid of having a negative thought, because Mm -hmm. the belief was if you have some negative thought, you're going to attract something really bad. And so I ended up being phobic of negativity, which in itself is negative. Can you relate? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's almost like a you can't win battle with your brain because right. you, you want to think positive, but then if you even doubt something, then that's negative. But then if you're thinking about that, it's negative. That's a negative thought because you shouldn't judge your thoughts. It was just like this, this trap. Um, yeah, like a hamster wheel. Yes, and it, and it's it also leads to just um, a lot of confusion. <laughs> mm-hmm. Agreed. And then how did you handle it if you came across someone who in your mind was being negative or thinking negative or speaking negative? I really struggled to be around um, that person because I was so afraid that it would affect me and like bring down my um, energy to theirs. So it it just is really fear evoking, but you're not allowed to be afraid. Um, So it's a trap especially getting more into the new age and wanting to have a higher vibration than being around people who aren't, who don't have their eyes open or are stuck in a Christian dogma would have been seen as bringing my vibration down. But it's just amazing. Um, It amazes me how quick I was or how quick we can be to believe such wild, intricate things, but so uh, slow to believe just the simple biblical truth of the gospel like Mm -hmm. it that amazes me but it shouldn't because um the bible says unbelievers are spiritually blinded um to spiritual truth by satan but man i sure was we were talking about um the law of attraction and how it's crazy making right because you have this vicious cycle where you have to stay positive And if negative things happen, you attracted it. It's your fault Mm -hmm. because you're in control because you're a god or a goddess. And and then that trying to stay positive all the time is impossible. Right. And I was amazed too in when I was recently um, looking back at it, it was saying like, if, if you're in a car crash or if you're in a building and there's a natural disaster and, or if like that someone is in a building and a natural disaster happens and they die, like you might think it's wild to think that they attracted it to themselves, but they did. And it's just, it's, an, it's, it's crazy. It's, and it's cruel too. It, exactly. So it's really cruel. And, and it's, it's really denying God's ultimate will that God is right. sovereign and that he allows things to happen for his glory and often to draw people closer to him. So right. um, it just cuts God out of it. It's, it's it an ath- The secret is atheistic. Yes, it is. Jeez. And um, it amazes me too, just that when we try to make ourselves God, how sad that is. There's no morality. That means that the worst person on earth can just think positive thoughts and and attract whatever they want. It has nothing to do with, with anything except how you're thinking. And it, it just all kind of blows up in its own face. Um, yeah. But it's alluring because it promises similar things to what Satan promised Jesus, which is, it promises us the world. It promises us so many material gifts, the things that we think will give us joy. And that's alluring to us in our sinful nature. But even like, it's, it's just a lie. It doesn't lead to actual joy or, or what we're looking for at all. It doesn't. When I was uh, the top selling new age author, I seemed to have it all materially. I, you know, my husband, and I had that ranch in Hawaii. We had just, we could buy whatever we wanted. We were taking first class trips paid for by the publisher and just, you know, goes on and on and on. And I was still seeking I was still looking for what would make me happy. So Mm -hmm. it wasn't it. And Jesus is it. Everyone, you can't, Mm -hmm. you can't be peaceful without Jesus. I mean, it's like that, that axiom, no Jesus, no peace, no Jesus, no peace. The peace that we seek in the new age, but can never find except for a few moments in a yoga class or a meditation class. And it's so fleeting and you're always chasing it. And, and I just wanted to circle back because you mentioned Disney a couple times. Mm. And so let's 
let's talk about that in depth. How did Disney affect you? Yeah, I, I almost try to steer away from this because it's hard even for me because I loved Disney so much, but just, I think the putting it in, I think it's interesting how they put it in small children's minds, um, sorcery, magic, there's so much sorcery magic and, um, just believing that if you wish upon a star, like you can make your dreams come true. If you just have enough belief basically. Um, and so much of it reminded me so much of ultimately the, some of the darkest corners of the occult, um, as I was driving, um, when I did end up joining a really intense occult order, as I was driving there, I was listening to Fantasmic, um, which is, um, a Disney show at Disneyland, but because it all made sense now, the way that they were transmuting the darkness and the, like their the whole show made sense to me now. I was like, this, this is crazy. And so how can this dark occult order be that bad if this is so familiar to me since I was a child, I loved this show and that's all what it meant. So it just, it is amazing to me and, and sad, honestly, that when we think that our children aren't affected by growing up with sorcery being glamorized. And then later it's like, well, why, why would me getting a witchcraft book at Barnes and Noble be bad? Like it's, I've, I grew up around it. It kind of descends, in my opinion, it desensitizes yes. um, us yeah, to magic. It does. A lot of people are not aware that Walt Disney was a 33 degree um, Freemason and, of the Scottish Rite. And mm -hmm. the, that's the order that um, we're going to talk about and goes into her, hermeneutics, which is what um, the secret's based on. It's mm -hmm. ancient Egyptian occult that I was really into when I was a new ager before I was saved. I've repented from it. But, uh, I would have nothing to do with it now. It sounds like you had the same experience where you saw the symbology in the mm -hmm. Disney show because you were part of this order. Is that correct? Right. Yes, absolutely. The dark it, symbology of Disney. And and I should mention, you grew up in Southern California, I believe, right? So, I did. So you were probably at Disney physically a lot. A whole lot, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and that's exactly how it happened when I was eventually deep in the occult, looking back and seeing all of the symbolism. I didn't, um, it, it made me justify what I was doing in the occult as not that bad, if if that's what I'd been Mm -hmm. If I if I grew up doing that, it almost seemed like my destiny to to end up here. Disney makes uh, witchcraft and sorcery seem innocent and right. attractive, and so if it's okay with Disney, it must be okay. Like you right. said, desensitizes children. Let's talk about this this occult order that you got into. So it was a segue from the secret. Um. Yes, I really did continue on just in a lot of. Um, just a mess, my addictions, um, just really like snowballing of shame and um, guilt and ad addiction and ended up going to college, um, had dated a lot of people, but had one boyfriend that really talked a lot about spirituality, um, especially Native American spirituality. And so my thinking, oh, I'm a Christian, kind of, I started giving some of it away as he was telling me more about, you know, the elements and just more um, spiritual. I was more spiritual at that point than Christian. And then um, that relationship was abusive and just a mess, but I thought that's what love was. And I ended up um, in another relationship with a guy who is a drug dealer. And, but the first, the second I saw him, I felt the same familiar feeling that I had felt when I saw the entities. So I, I just, I was immediately um, so allured to him and he started teaching me about new age, the new age movement. Um, he didn't use those words, but it was just very much about fate and um, twin flame kind of um, discussions that we'd known each other for eternity past almost and we'd lived hundreds of lives and so I believed that we had lived hundreds of lives and in most of them we were together in some of them we chose to have a different experience because we were the universe experiencing itself and so whatever I had left of 
um, a somewhat biblical understanding of Jesus Christ, he really didn't believe. And so I just, I idolized this man. He became like a God to me. And so I, I let go of all the a small amount of biblical truth that I had and totally ate up all that he was teaching me. I thought he was so much more ascended than me. And so um, I really believed this and that gave him a really big level of power over my life. Um, and we started getting into crystal magic and um, he was DJing at these festivals where there was just a lot more of um, the actual practicing of magic and moon magic and just a lot of um sexual things going on there and um i praise the lord for giving me restraint in that area but just being surrounded by these um, new age practices and me feeling like it was my christian dogma holding me back from being truly a free spirit and um, showing love in these ways and really awakening the kundalini and having this higher level of awareness and ascending. And really during that time, I was really into um, the spirit science and metaphysics. So it's just, it's cool to see all the connections, um, seeing people get saved out of that. Like, but, like Stephen Bancar said, exactly. spirit science. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. But that was really feeding into my um, understanding. It was everything that I was experiencing. And so um just diving deeper and deeper into this worldview, I guess, of reality, but continue becoming more and more addicted um, and just really going downhill and finding my entire worth in this man, but being, it was a very manipulative, abusive, um, spiritually relationship that I completely lost myself in. Um, I didn't know who I was from a young age, but in this relationship, I just completely and totally like found my identity in this person and in this religion that he um, was teaching me. And um, we ended up breaking up in a way that was super confusing that he told me, like, he still loved me and we were the same person um, and he was going to come back for me. He just had to make a name for himself. And so I had just moved to Hollywood to be closer to him. And I was just kind of left in the studio apartment I felt like my entire identity had been ripped from me. Um, I was being very manipulated and I just kind of lost it because I was like, wow, I don't know who I am at all. I'm, I'm so addicted now to drugs and alcohol. Like I hated who I was and I had, I had lost my sanity um, or I was beginning to really lose my sanity. We'd started doing psychedelic drugs and just, um, a lot more demonic experiences. I remember looking in the mirror at his apartment and just my blood running cold when I saw my reflection, because I didn't recognize whatever was behind my eyes. Mm. I'd been asking, um, to channel entities doing automatic writing. So I shouldn't have been surprised because I was asking to have these experiences, but I didn't really put together that as I'm, as I'm begging, as I'm wanting a supernatural experience so badly that I'm begging these entities to take control of my body, that, that, that would have some kind of effect that would be bad. And I was beginning to see the fruit that was leading to death in these things. Mm, the bad fruit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And so then what happened? You, you got involved with the group at that point? I did. I was, um, alone in that studio apartment, just really seeking. Um, at that point, I just really snapped. I had been trying to, the Lord had been so kind to give me a level of restraint. There were some things that I just couldn't do, but when I lost this person, I just snapped and thought, you know what, it's not worth it. I'm going to go all in. I'm going to gain all the power because I'd, I'd f had physical manifestations outside of my control when holding like a cult object. So I, I knew that there was a power there. I was just, I knew it was bad, but I got to that point where I just snapped and, and said, I'm going to go for it. I, I need control of my life. Um, there were a lot of things going on in my life. Like my dad was homeless at that time and just so many things that I just lost it. And so I started opening myself up more to these entities. I began being led by um, an entity 
called Thoth or Toth. And oh yeah, Te Tehote, yeah. Yes. I actually wrote books about him, and I wrote kind of channeled messages from him. Yeah. Also known, also known as Merlin in Celtic spirituality, and known as Hermes. Right. The winged messenger in Greco-Roman spirituality. Yeah. So you're talking about what I mentioned earlier, the hermeneutics, the mm -hmm. Egyptian occult, which, as you said, has a power, it has effects, but it's coming from demonic sources. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I'm so glad that you said that because when I was in my studio apartment, I was just asking to be led and I was led to ancient Egyptian mystery schools and obsessed with the pyramids and just mm -hmm. all of that stuff, sacred yep. geometry, just diving deep. And then when this entity started leading me, it was like everything that it was leading me to um, was just like the next step. And it was so real. Things were shining in my reality. And so even though it was so exciting to me, it was like treasure hunting. Um, it also freaked me out because um, I knew that I wasn't getting any better. I was still just as addicted and I was losing my mind. The more I would, the more I'm following this entity that's so real and things are glowing and all this, I, I couldn't have conversations with people because there was no real solid line between reality and the dream state or right. whatever else I was seeing. Yep. yep. Yeah. And, you were, you were in a trance state. It sounds like. Right. Yep. And I understand. That, that was terrifying. Um, mm -hmm. So being led, I was led to these uh, Thoth tarot cards that were uh, made by Aleister Crowley. And I knew that Aleister Crowley was known as one of the most wicked men to have ever lived, but I justified why, what I was doing by saying, like, well, things only have power if you give them power, you know, this inanimate object doesn't have power over me unless I give it power over me. And so I was just continually, again, because I didn't, I had never read the Bible. I didn't know truth. I just mm -hmm. knew culture and I knew what other things were throwing at me. And so I was trying to form my own understanding that was just completely deceptive. Right. And so I'm, I'm explaining away why it's okay. And I can be right with God and do this. And so I became just obsessed with these tarot cards and doing them all the time and um, dreaming about them and practicing lucid dreaming, training myself all day to wake up in my dreams and then doing astral projection. And just really my whole life during that time was only focused on spiritual activities. Um, and it was so alluring, but I, I, I wasn't getting what I was looking for. And so I just basically, to make years in, into a short thing, I just kept searching, things were glowing. One of the days, the thing that was glowing was this Freemason Lodge. Um, I reached out to them to join and they let me know only men could be Freemasons, but there were offshoots um, like the Eastern Star and, and women offshoots. But I, I told myself I couldn't be in the order of the Eastern star because they had a pentagram. And so just these little things I was making. I remember having that same rule. It's so, really, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I couldn't get into witchcraft or pentagrams. I completely relate to what you're saying. Yes. It, it's amazing. Um, but I, the order on the back of my cards, the, the Thoth or Toth uh, tarot cards said the hermetic order of the golden dawn I'd really felt drawn to that, but I told myself, well, I can't do that because of Aleister Crowley's connection. He used to be in it, but I just kept being led back to it. And so um, the people who started the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn were Freemasons. So then it was another connection. And finally, I just got to a point where I kept being led back and it seemed like I was being led back to the store and I just needed to go through it. And so I called them. I met the guy at a coffee shop in LA and every single thing he was talking to me about. Well, first of all, it was the first time where someone just seemed so familiar and we were clearly on the same page and everything he was talking to me about from, you know, the Emerald tablets to astrology, to ancient Egyptian mythology, everything was everything that I had been led to. And so I was like, yes, someone's speaking my language. This is it. And so he told me to meet him at the Freemason Lodge um, to be initiated into the order. Um, and so I went and 
there was like a woman waiting at the top of the stairs in like a black robe with a candle. And it was just very like in the movies kind of thing. Um, but I was so excited that was on the way there. I was listening to Fantasmic because in my mind, like this is what I've been trained for my whole life. It, it made so much sense to me from, from the Disney to the law of attraction, all of it just had been leading me to this moment because what I was learning about magic in the occult was the same thing as the law of attraction, only the law of attraction was just watered down ritual magic. And so it just all made sense to me and it didn't seem like such a big deal. I think if I jumped from never experiencing those things in childhood or throughout my life and just planted in a Freemason lodge, that would be horrific. But because it, I had been desensitized to it, um, it didn't seem like that big of a deal. Um, but I could tell that it was dark because um, it just was. And so I was initiated into this order, um, but I was really excited because they were that you have to go into the darkness to shine the light of knowledge in it. And so the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn was a lot of Kabbalah, Wicca, Gnosticism, um, just a, a Hinduism, a bunch of stuff mashed together. And um, it really excited me to be in this order, um, learning all these things, practicing ritual magic, invoking the ancient Egyptian deities um, like Thoth. And, but I still wasn't like, I still wasn't getting what I was looking for. And that really got to me because I couldn't think of anywhere further to go. And yet it wasn't there. And that was um, hard for me to realize that the really high ups in this order, I loved them and they were so loving in not a biblical way, but, you know, in the worldly way to me, but they they didn't have the peace that I was looking for. They had addictions just like me. I could tell they were depraved like me and that scared me. Um, but what brought up really those realizations is that during this time, um, my grandpa had come to visit me out of nowhere and he had sat my cousin and I down and said, um, what's your relationship with God like? And I was so prideful and excited to tell him all the things that I'd been learning. And so I probably said, oh, I've been reading this religious book and this one and this one. And I'm so much closer to God now because I'm opening my eyes to these other paths. And he just said, Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. And no one comes to the father except through him. And that shook me so much. Like I was so mad, but I was physically shaking because I knew it was true and that terrified me. But in my mind, I was so angry that he would have the gall to say that to me and how judgmental, but it didn't matter, even though for a while that ruined our relationship because as I'm in the Freemason Lodge practicing magic, the Lord is like, his word doesn't return void. It accomplishes what he wills mm -hmm. it to successfully. Yes. And it was just being just echoing in me. Um, and then because of Kabbalah, um, I had been reading parts of the Bible and I read that you can tell a tree by its fruit. I didn't know what that meant, but I knew that the fruit that I was seeing from these leaders was bad fruit. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and I also read that you, that Satan masquerades himself as an angel of light. And that one really got me because yeah. I'd kept telling myself, how can this be bad if it seems good? And so, yeah. Yes. And the Freemasons, they, they, do, they seem to be very charitable. They seem to do a lot of good and help children and such. And, and, and so that's what people focus on as opposed to focusing on what they're actually teaching people. Right. And I love that the Lord had you realize that the leaders, which is the direction you were going in that at that time, the leaders did not have what you were seeking. They did not have peace. They did not have sobriety. So it was another hamster wheel that you were on. Right. Yes. And, and just the Lord's kindness to not give me like to not give me peace, but give me that, um, through his word convicting me that this yes. okay, really compare this to, to what is going on here, um, really stood out to me. And just, again, like it's hard because 
as a woman, I couldn't be a Freemason. So even though I can't speak for Freemasonry, I can say that we use their ritual rooms mm -hmm. and their symbolism was the same as ours. And the people who yeah. started the Golden Dawn were Freemasons. So the connections are so deep and um, that there's a, there's a very clear relation to the two. Yep. Yeah, yeah. We want to be very, very cautious to stay away from anyone who is a 33 degree Mason. Um, of course, that's why Disney had the club 33 because of the three, three, which is number six, of course. And um, pastor Chris Rosebro has been cataloging some of the very popular professing Christian teachers who are actually 33 degree Freemasons. It'll shock yeah. you. He's got some videos on it. So I'll point people to fighting for the faith to learn more. Uh, it's it's just this infiltration of the so-called secret. Um, and as you said, it's just a repeat of what the, the devil did to Jesus in Jesus's time in the wilderness, where the devil was promising everything in the world if Jesus would only comply. And then it comes through the new age, the secret, the law of attraction, and ultimately, because all this deception is like a progressive disease. They get worse and worse and worse. It leads to people getting into the occult and Satan worship. And praise mm -hmm. the Lord for uh, his mercy and kindness and grace in saving us out of that darkness. Yes, it's amazing. Um, and so as I was in that order and these, and the Lord is convicting me, um, I just really had no peace and but I was so prideful that I continued doing it. And then one night I just remembered um, the lie that Satan told in the garden, that if you eat from the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, you'll become like God knowing good and evil. And that was really the premise in the, the occult is that the duality of light and darkness. And that if you eat from the tree of good and evil, you'll have the secret knowledge and become like God. And so in that moment, I knew it was Satan, but I was still so prideful that I didn't turn because this was my whole life now. And I had the pride that I'm really good at this and just pride that I didn't want to leave it. Um, but one night I was walking across my apartment and it was just like any other night. Um, but I collapsed my knees in like a spiritual attack and it felt like my soul was being sucked out into complete darkness. And I heard myself cry out, Jesus Christ, save me. It was amazing to hear myself say that out of everything. But in that moment when I did, I meant it. And the God of the Bible, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit saved me. And whatever was attacking me was just gone. And I felt this peace that I'd been looking for my entire life. And I also was shaking because I was aware that, wow, God is real, the God of the Bible, which means my sin is really sin. And so I was terrified um, but I knew that, that Jesus was real. And so yes. I got out my Bible from under the bed that I'd been keeping there from the very scary supernatural experiences I'd been having with aliens and all that. And I just started reading. And, um, as I read it, it amazed me that I kind of was reading it to, or I thought I had this secret knowledge, but it was actually feeding me with all these other new age or occult or secret knowledge books, they just left me hungrier. The more I learned, the less I knew. And it was just this hamster wheel, like you said. But as I'm reading God's word, it was just filling me. And it it amazed me. And by the time I finished reading the Bible, I had completely changed from the inside. And that amazed me because I'd done nothing to deserve it. I hadn't done hours of meditations or rituals. I just believe that Jesus is who he says he is in the Bible. And I read his word and, and his word had transformed me. And that amazed me. So for, for the first time I knew I could get sober, which was amazing to me. I thought I never thought I could. I just locked myself away in my apartment and God was so faithful to be there for me, speak to me through his word, just for me to teach, for him to teach me how to depend on him. And he never let me down and he never will because he's the God of the universe. Um, mm -hmm. And actually I saw something that you posted today about like, why would we pray to the moon and the stars when we have the God 
of the universe. Right. And it's so true. It's just, there is nothing better than having a relationship with the God who created all things. And he is so, he's such a better God than you could ever be. Like the promise that Satan gives us to become our own God is, is a trap and it always leads to the fall because we make terrible gods, but yeah. God is so good. So it, I'm so amazed by who he is. Praise the Lord. What a yes. redemption story. <laughs> I'm so excited to talk with you about this and to share mm -hmm. this with others who will relate and, and also to warn people that, you know, you get into the new age through these seemingly innocent sounding ways, like the book, The Secret. Um, right. And and then it just leads you down this darker and darker path because you become addicted to wanting that power and wanting to manifest and attract and, and to be a powerful healer. And it just leads you through one door and another door, and another door until you're in the occult before you know it. And it's a trap. Right. It really is. And just even astrology is so popular and it, it breaks my heart to see how much the words man like manifestation or like main character energy or um, astrology is so mainstream that yeah. no one bats an eye anymore. Or even I just went to Barnes and Noble the other day and there's like a witchcraft section. Um, it's everywhere. And just because yes. it's everywhere or just because like um, in Galatians, when Paul says, even if an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel cr contrary, like if even an angel comes down or an alien comes down and preaches to you another gospel, like let him be accursed. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how prevalent these lies are in our society. That doesn't make them any less lies. Um, in Deuteronomy 18, God says that those who practice like divination, sorcery, um, the people are an abomination to God. Yeah. So if these things and the people who practice them are an abomination to God, it doesn't matter what the culture says the culture says crazy things sometimes it's still today is an abomination to god yeah um so and and yeah <laughs> yeah i i hear you um and it's just god gave us a new life a new heart and mm -hmm. renewed our mind through his word and just changed our worldview that's why i never try to argue people's worldview because that's god doing that you know <laughs> it's just God will lead us to his word in the Bible. Let's talk about your dad too. I've right. seen so many beautiful photos and I think some videos of you with your dad. You can see how close you both are. Yes. Um, so my dad, when, after I was saved, um, he was homeless and he just got to a point on the street where he said, God, like I'm done. Um, if you want my life, like I'm done fighting, you can take it. And just he says almost right then very soon after someone walked up to him and asked him if he was a veteran and he said yes and they took him to the VA which he'd done many many times before and gone through the rehab there but this time he really had surrendered to the mm -hmm. Lord right. and he got sober and his whole thing was just I, I can just I really want to be on stage playing the drums again one day because that was what he had done um, before the alcohol and the drugs had really taken that he was a professional drummer. And that would just break my heart because I was thinking, you know, we're in LA now and he's um, his body has been physically taxed by his lifestyle and that's just not going to happen. And one day he messaged me just saying, you won't believe it. Like I walked into this building and it just, they just happened to be having a rehearsal and they needed a drummer. And now I'm the drummer at the Salvation Army here. Nice. So then he was, um, doing worship in this church there and just God's faithfulness to be so amazingly kind and just seeing my dad being built up. And then during COVID, he's just been so built up by Redeemer, um, Redeemer Bible Church where I go and just seeing him grow in the Lord. It's amazing because we're not only like father and daughter and we have a healthy relationship now, but he's my brother in Christ right. and I can call him and he tells me scripture and just, it's, it, it just amazes me that my dad at the age of 69, after a lifetime of shame and addiction was just saved. Like it's never too late for anyone to be saved. And, and 
I'm just so amazed by that. So God has just been so kind to restore that re- relationship. But ultimately, I can have the peace of of seeing that it's not me who holds my dad because I felt that for so long of responsibility, but that truly God has my dad and it's God who's going to finish the work that he started in him. Um, and I'm just, I'm just so amazed by who God is and his power to save. I love it. And it shows in your photos with him, this beautiful, <laughs> this beautiful glow of light and in, in this love you guys share. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about how, because when I first met you, you were in Southern California. I think you were going to Calvary Chapel back then. Right. And then, and then now you're, you sing at Costi Hens Church in Arizona, <laughs> your whole life changed. So can you talk about that whole fairy tale transformation? <laughs> yes. Um, I, I loved my church in Hollywood and I did not want to leave. Um, but I was asked to, to share what God's done in my life and to sing at a church in Arizona. And after I came back, I just believed like I was maybe being I was supposed to be out there or something, but I was really confused. But every time I'd be in the word, I was convicted that I was like holding on. I just wasn't being obedient to where I believe God was calling me to go. And during that time, I was starting to have confusion about, is it, can I lead congregational worship and, and do that with Hillsong and Bethel? music songs. Um, I was starting to feel really convicted about it, but I didn't know anyone that shared those convictions. And I kind of thought I was going crazy because as a, um, you know, only a few years old in the faith, I'm like, where is this conviction coming from? Um, but so so you had been a worship leader at your church in California singing from apostate churches of elevation and Bethel Reading. And you were getting convicted, but you were doubting your conviction because there wasn't anyone else talking about it back then. Right. And, and you said, well, I'm a new Christian. I love that. Yes. Um, and then I had just watched American gospel with my pastor a few days before. And so I looked up online, can Christians sing Bethel or something like that? And the first video that came up was a video from Redeemer Bible church. It's a great video. And it was um, Costi and I believe our lead pastor, John, and a few others talking about why they don't sing Bethel and everything they're saying. I was like, oh, this is exactly yes. what I've been convicted of. This is mm-hmm. so cool that there are other people like who think that and, and what they're saying makes so much sense. And so their videos started coming up more. And that was just kind of in tandem with this, like believing that I'm being called to Arizona, but not understanding why. Um, and so that went on for a few months of being in the word and just really being like, Lord, like, help me, (laughs) please, through your word, show me what to do. Um, And just seeing the faithful ministry there. And anyway, long story short, um, I, they ended up, Costi ended up coming out to LA right down the street from me during that time of me praying. And so I went and I met him and another one of our pastors and they were just like, come on over Gilbert's great. And that was just such a big confirmation. Um, And then I just, got an apartment without ever going to Gilbert, Arizona, just got it. And then, um, and yeah, and it's just been amazing. I am just so so you're on staff at Redeemer church in Gilbert, Arizona with Costi Hen as the lead pastor. Yes. And it's such a blessing to be surrounded by such wonderful men who so desire to always be behind Jesus. Um, it, I've just, I'm so thankful to have that because it's just such a, a, a fertile place to be growing in the Lord under sound teaching. Um, I'm very thankful. Yeah. And if, um, if you're watching this, you're not familiar with Costi Hen's work, I'm going to put a link to his website for the gospel uh, in the description of this video below and also links to a couple of his videos, including the one that Jack just mentioned um, that are must watches and his books that are fabulous. Yes, they are. Mm-hmm. very thankful for him. I can say yeah. just from being around him, like he is the real deal. He loves the Lord very, very much. And he's all about pointing to Jesus and not himself. And so Amen. that's wonderful to be around. Yeah. And, and his story like ours is a story of redemption where he's, he is Benny Hinn's nephew and he used to be a catcher for Benny Hinn, meaning that when people were slain in the spirit and they would fall back and he would catch them. And he was part of that whole entourage of the first 
class to the nines lifestyle, spending all the money they were getting from tithes and offerings. And the Lord convicted him out of that. And he wrote a wonderful book on that. Um, here's the book and the links below. And so you get to sit under him and his solid teaching. Now, this is just so amazing because you were looking for solid teaching and here you are. Yes. I'm so thankful. Only Jesus. He is, he is such a redeemer and I'm so thankful and I'm thankful for your encouragement throughout this whole process. You've been my internet sister. Yeah. <laughs> same here with you that. with me. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. Oh, it's so great to finally get the chance to talk because we've been wanting to do this video for probably a year now. <laughs> so right. I'm glad that we finally pushed the button and made this happen because your story needs to be heard. Yay. Well, thank you so much for letting me come on and, and talk with you. Is there anything else that you want to share with anyone who's watching who may be in the new age or the occult right now? Um, I would just say that if you're um, practicing astrology or or some of the things that you would think aren't that big of a deal or justifying it saying, well, it's not really divination or it's not really this, just to really um, encourage you to read Deuteronomy 18 or really just if you've never read the Bible for yourself, read read the Bible um, so that you know for yourself what God says about um, these practices and just that they really aren't innocent. I know that we can so easily make distinctions. Oh, I practice white magic and not black magic, or I'm just manifesting. Um, we throw these words around a lot, but when at their core, what they really are is is against God. It's rebellion. And so just to read the Bible for yourself and really make sure that you know the gospel, that you know what Jesus has done for you. We've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God, but God is holy. He is so good. He's so far above us. And because we've, we're in our sin, we're sinners. Um, we need to be reconciled with God. And the only way that we can do that is through Jesus Christ. Um, we have failed. We have fallen short, but Jesus came down as the God man and he died in our place, bearing our sins, bearing the wrath of God in our place so that we could be reconciled to God. Um, and that we could be cr 